Before we get started today, Daniel, I want to let our listeners know that we've got a super cool new thing that we're really excited to share. Yeah, this is something we're really excited about. A new way for the listeners to engage with the show, uh, contribute, uh, send us stories, narratives, and, and a way for us to respond on air. That's right. This is the first Ashes Ashes call-in number. Uh, it's not a live call-in number. We don't have that tech set up yet, and uh, we are by no means ready for those types of live shows. I don't think anybody wants them. But uh, you can now call this number, which I'll give you in just a moment, and leave a voicemail that we can grab the recording from, add it to the show. Uh, we're going to use this for asking for stories from listeners. If you have comments, critiques, whatever, if you just want to curse this out, feel free. This is the number that you can now do that in. Uh, we're really excited for this, and we hope that it'll play into future episodes and we can get more listener involvement because we have such a great community of listeners from all around the world. That's right. Now that number, if you want to call in, this is an American number, so plus one. I'm actually not even sure what will happen if you call internationally. Um, but we can worry about that <laughs> at a future time, I guess. We'll just get like a $500 bill in the mail. We'll just add it to our other giant bills. Someone from overseas calls us and leaves us like, a hundred voicemails. Well, if you want to bankrupt us, this is a great way to do it, I guess. But <laughs> outside of that, the number, if you want to call American area code plus one is 313-99-ASHES. That's 313-992-7437. So give us a call. Hearing from our listeners, receiving feedback, hearing the stories that you all bring, it's very addictive to us. It's addicting, idiot. No, addictive is the proper word there, Daniel, yes. Yeah, we'd love to hear from you all. And this is something we hope to use as we promote what future topics will be. It'll give you a chance to call in, give us some of your perspectives that we can share on the podcast. First example, we're going to be doing a show coming up probably next week where we'll celebrate some of the do-it-yourself projects that many people engage with to solve needs and solve problems without turning immediately to consumerism. David, I know you mentioned you were having some problems with your uh, AC unit, and rather than go out and buy a new one, you figured out how to take it apart, clean it. And we want to hear all kinds of stories from you. Uh, let us know what you do to quick fix things in your own life. Let us know what you do to step outside the consumer machine and solve your own problems. Uh, but with that little bit of news out of the way, let's start the show. I'm David Torsivia. I'm Daniel Forkner. And this is Ashes, Ashes, a show about systemic issues, cracks in civilization, collapse of the environment, and if we're unlucky, the end of the world. But if we learn from all of this, maybe we can stop that. The world might be broken, but it doesn't have to be. On behalf of the eight generations of my family who have been in this country. We're gonna put a little fuel in your bus. Now I've got the alumni over there and this is a challenge to you alumni. This is my class, 2019. And my family is making a grant to eliminate their student loans. David, that was uh, the commencement speech given by billionaire Robert Smith pledging to pay for the 2019 graduate class, pay for all their student loans. That was tremendous news. Um, and it's, it's really wonderful for those graduates, David. Yeah, congratulations, uh, graduates, on happening to graduate at the exact right time that you get your student loans wiped. Uh, really excited for y'all, y'all. No, it's super exciting for them, but you know, it does raise some questions. And, you know, in terms of philanthropy, in terms of the role that billionaires play in our society, um, we have a whole episode on that, episode 61, Owning Change. I highly recommend checking that out. And we won't get into that right now, but it's kind of uh, topical right now because we figured let's do an episode kind of introducing a series on higher education and universities in general and all the things that revolve around that that play into some of these systemic issues that we talk about. And of course, student debt is going to be one of those components. We might touch on that a little bit in this episode, 
Yeah, I mean, this is such a big topic, Daniel, which is part of the reason why we've been putting it off for so long. There's so much to say and dig into in academics. Uh, and I don't want to call it an industry, but it really sort of has become one. And we'll talk about that throughout this episode. But for something that is a huge component of what it means to be alive, to be a human, to always be learning and trying to expand our knowledge of the universe, uh, there's there's a reason that we put this this show off for so long. Um, this is very much an introduction of a lot of topics and ideas. And in the future, we hope to dig into them more and more. And I know we say that all the time, but I think at this point, you listeners have realized that that is exactly why we're here. Yeah. So let's jump in to this first episode. And you mentioned that there's a part of universities that has become an industry. And that's really what this episode will be about. There's a book that we dug into a little bit, David, called Speaking of Universities by Stefan Collini. And he talks about how the landscape of universities has really accelerated and changed dramatically in the past few decades. In the past 20 years alone, China has added 1,200 universities. In the United Kingdom, in 1990, there were 46 universities. And today, there are now over 140, which jumped the student enrollment from 350,000 people to over 2 million today. And of course, in the United States, we have over 4,000 institutions that make up our landscape of higher education. And with these dramatic shifts in terms of expanding the number of opportunities to attend a university. Stefan writes about how the language we use to talk about universities has also dramatically changed. So I want to read a little bit from his book here. The policy descriptions we use to talk about universities, quote, were mostly not the descriptions used even a generation ago, let alone any further back in history. Our concepts and our language have their own histories, and the process by which one pattern of using them comes to be dominant at any given time is something that intellectual historians can chart with considerable precision. There is nothing natural or given about thinking of universities in terms of, say, social mobility or wealth creation any more than there was about thinking of them in terms of character formation or the propagation of God's word. We need to be able to articulate an understanding of what universities are for that is adequate to our time if we are to be able to decide what to do. So the language we use to talk about the function of universities has changed. And it's important to recognize that he's writing primarily about uh, British universities and their departure from a long history in Europe of universities being considered a public good that is distinct from industry. He goes on, quote, very often my interlocutors and audiences were people who had admired the British university system, but who could see that it was now being treated as the guinea pig in a series of market fundamentalist experiments. Most Northern European countries still maintain a publicly supported system of higher education where, whatever the precise financial arrangements, universities are regarded as a public good, even in some countries as the bearers of civic or republican values. Many European colleges were clearly worried that business-driven governments might in the future try to impose policies modeled along the new British lines in their own countries, end quote. And so this transformation that he writes about, this changing landscape, the guinea pig that are the British universities, what he's talking about is how increasingly university models are being fused with the world of industry and corporate profits, which is a big departure from the long kind of changing history of universities, mostly being explicitly separate from the interests of industry or practical applications in general. Although there are a few exceptions to that that he mentions, you know, the way that universities in the past were encouraged by the state to encourage certain characteristics that would make scholars well-suited for government work, or a corollary to that is the church doing the same thing. But according to Kalini, never before have universities been subject to such pressure to conform to industrial models and and to prepare people for the corporate world. And he writes that these changes are occurring in Britain faster than anywhere else in the world. And many thinkers throughout history have always considered this to be problematic. Uh, He quotes T.H. Huxley, who wrote in 1894, uh, this is a legend in applied science. He wrote, quote, the primary business of universities has to do merely with pure knowledge and pure art independent of all application to practice, with the advancement of culture and not with the increase of wealth or commodities. And then the father of nuclear physics, 
said in 1927 that he, quote, would view as an unmitigated disaster the utilization of university laboratories for research bearing on industry. I, I got to interrupt you for a second right there, Daniel, because it wasn't that long ago on this very show that we were talking about how universities and the research laboratories that they had were actually twisted by the governments of the world during World War I to start producing weapons of war, right? So in our tear gas and protest episode just very recently, uh, we mentioned how during the war there were laboratories all around the world that were originally just public research institutions who focused on creating these deadly gases for use on the battlefield. Right. And once the battlefield ended, then these university laboratories started turning to producing these gases for uh, private industry and markets. So even though he's writing this in 1927 saying that, that this would be an unmitigated disaster if we were using these laboratories for industry, it was already well underway at this point. And maybe he just didn't realize this uh, process because his more theoretical focus of his uh, research wasn't seeing the applications that were happening at the current time in the chemistry industry. But this is something that that has been uh, going on for almost 100 years at this point. Yeah, no, no, great point. And, and we talk about that in episode 73, Tear Up, Tear Down, about so many university academics and chemists were directed by governments during World War I to direct their energies towards developing chemical weapons of mass destruction. But I think generally, even after World War II, you know, universities were kind of distinct from industry. They were still considered largely as institutions where people go to explore long-term thinking, to explore the unknown, to research things that may not have any really immediate practical benefit. But the idea has always kind of been that the benefits we derive from universities as a society are always long-term and indirect. We can't really predict how uh, tinkering with some idea or some other uh, science might produce some invention that we can use. But that's never really been the point. It's kind of always been assumed that these things just emerge uh, from just having a more uh, intellectual society, a, a society that's open to questioning things. In fact, I want to quote from Joseph Chamberlain. He was a, actually, interestingly enough, he was a great British imperialist of the 19th century. But nevertheless, he writes, quote, to place a university in the middle of a great industrial and manufacturing population is to do something to leaven the whole mass with higher aims and higher intellectual ambitions than would otherwise be possible to people engaged entirely in trading and commercial pursuits, end quote. But all this started to change dramatically in the 1980s when universities started to conform to a market logic. That is, they need to compete against one another on pricing and offerings, performing well on such metrics as you know, customer satisfaction, measured in graduates' ability to perform in the corporate world, and also competing for funding by demonstrating how research can aid industry. And this new shift is something that is taken for granted, I think, at least here in the U.S., you know, I remember speaking with a pathologist researcher at a university, actually, when we were preparing for that show, Irresistible David, on antimicrobial resistant pathogens, right? And I spoke to one of these uh, researchers who spends most of their time meeting with local livestock companies and then working with them to develop medicines to help them grow their business. And I kind of got the impression that this person gets their funding essentially by presenting companies with studies that seem promising to their business model. And so we are well into the realm where it's not unusual to think in this way, even in a highly research-oriented department of a university. Yeah, well, I mean, you have that term, research universities, right? Which refer to universities that focus on whatever type of research, usually something uh, scientific. Um, and a lot of the funding of these universities and the, their endowments, the money that they generate, come from the patents that they hold from this research. So uh, you're speaking about University of Georgia there. Um, they own a huge amount of patents, especially in uh, types of seeds used for turf, grass. Mm. And they make an enormous amount of the total budget for some of those departments from this patent licensing. So any research you can do, anything you can create in order to generate a profit for the university is something that the university sees as worth pursuing, and they'll push you down that road, not just for their, their professors or their tenured staff, but graduate students as well, trying to say, how can we invest in you so you can create something, our lab can patent it, and we, the university, can profit off of your work. 
and I mean, the world of graduate and uh, graduate studies is complicated and uh, depressing and very much worthy of its own show, which I, uh, we will get to at some point right. as somebody who has a lot of friends in grad school uh, right now and who have been in grad school for uh, years, um, depending on where they are and who they are. But but this is sort of the model now. So how, how can you make us money? Not how can we give you an education? Uh, and it, it really got twisted in this market perspective of seeing universities as ways to generate money instead of as a public good to impart knowledge solely. Right. And of course, this is problematic in so many ways. You know, the needs of businesses, for example, are typically short term because they can point to a need that they have saying, okay, I need to increase my market share, but this is my obstacle. How can I get around that? And when universities give up the type of long-term exploratory research that they're good at to try to fit themselves to the short-term needs of business, oftentimes the quality of research declines dramatically for several reasons. And then, of course, the idea of molding graduates to some corporate model that will make them good for employment can actually hurt people long-term because you know even businesses will admit that what they truly need in a candidate is someone who can think for themselves, that can ask deep questions, but a focus on a very specialized way of thinking and doing things can actually, you know, limit a person's ability to do that. Although I suppose, David, when we look at the trajectory of the current economy moving towards, you know, very specialized work in terms of... <laughs> well, before I let you go too far, Daniel, don't worry. All of our specialized work will soon be replaced by machines. So that's not actually a problem. Maybe all the more reason, David, we should be in school studying poetry because that's one thing machines can't do. I read a, a poem by a machine that's actually pretty good. You want to hear it? Uh, let, let me guess. Uh, one bit, two bit, three bit, four bits. Oh, how I love to count my bits. <laughs> uh, that's, that's pretty good, Daniel. Um, you might consider going back to a school for poetry. But here is a poem written by, by a computer that I read recently that's actually pretty good. Um, my heart, why come you here alone? The wild thing of my heart is grown. To be a thing, fairy and wild and fair and whole. Damn. So, uh, sorry, poets, they're coming for you, too. I think we found the superior species. Superior something. Wait, well, what were we talking about again? Universities? <laughs> okay, yeah, so back to the... Uh, so, so, basically, the point here is that as the global economy increasingly creeps into every corner possible of our lives... More and more of this market logic is being infused with conceptions of the role that higher education should serve. And now Collini, the author of this book, he's a little bit optimistic and you can tell he's a little bit on the defensive when it comes to criticism about universities as someone who is you know, a professor in a university environment. But he does offer what he imagines the worst case dystopian future of universities if things do not go unchecked. And I want to read that right here, David. The dominant character of higher education institutions across the world would be as businesses specializing in preparing people to work in business. Beyond that, a substantial number of large intake institutions will combine the teaching work of an advanced high school with an element of contract research work for outside organizations. A select number of other, mostly small and mostly private institutions will provide a broad cultural education mainly to the children of the relatively wealthy, and a very small number of historically prestigious, financially well-supported institutions will combine teaching a very select student intake with various forms of scholarship and research across several of the traditional areas of inquiry. Though with a huge numerical and financial preponderance in the biomedical and applied sciences and in professional training, especially in business and law. In all of these types of institution, there will be either a shrinking proportion or the complete elimination of tenured academics and a vast increase in a casualized workforce, while the vestiges of academic self-government will disappear entirely. There will be far less face-to-face -face or small group teaching and far more reliance on technology. Students will feel increasingly entitled to the good results that they have paid for. The humanities will be marginalized even further and will largely be studied by the children of the well-off. The more selective universities will feel themselves to be under more and more pressure to provide better facilities. What has been dubbed the amenities arms race 
will only speed up, and it will become harder to distinguish between universities and various kinds of luxury hotel or spa resort. Universities will become ever more dependent upon overseas student fees, and their selling of themselves in these markets will more and more shape their internal policies. We shall see soaring student debt, which will become more and more socially divisive. Making individual universities responsible for their students' loans will incentivize the production of high-earning graduates who are the best financial risk. The growth of private and especially for-profit universities will further reflect and entrench class privileges. The fact that they provide full scholarships for a number of applicants from less wealthy backgrounds cannot disguise the fact that both the commercial logic and the social tone of these institutions is set by the children of the well-off. Companies charging high fees for almost worthless online courses will make larger and larger profits. I could go on, but I do not believe that this bleak picture is inevitable, though at the moment it looks hideously plausible. I don't know. It sounds pretty close to what we have right now. That's what I was thinking when I was reading this, because, you know, he wrote this in 2017. Mm -hmm. Um, So like ages ago. (laughs) Practically a century ago. But like when he's describing... um, the humanities will be marginalized even further. Let's fast forward to this month, May of 2019, and see what's going on in Brazil, David. So here we are, Daniel, reporting live from Brazil right now. And uh, let me just say, May has been quite a turbulent month for education in Brazil. And it has culminated in the largest demonstrations and protests against President Bolsonaro since he came to office in January. And uh, right now they're taking place in over 200 cities. So first, the far-right president announced in early May that he would attempt to dismantle all philosophy and sociology departments from higher education. And this sparked international outrage, of course, as being a threat to democracy itself. Shortly after that announcement, the president declared that he would be cutting the funds for higher education across the board by 30 percent now according to the education minister quote the priority is preschool elementary school and technical school a scientific technical number-based efficient and managerial approach is vital to save this country from the economic stagnation of the last 20 years that we are living damn and david you did mention that uh, this has sparked international outrage and i want to read from an open letter that was written Uh, by people from universities in at least three different countries, now signed by 5,000 people that reads, quote, President Bolsonaro implies in his remarks that public funding should flow exclusively to professional schools. These are certainly important programs. However, a democratic society depends not only on its commercial productive output, but also its social institutions, its understanding of their foundations and governing principles, as well as its understanding of how these policies and institutions affect its population. Research in social sciences and humanities, and especially philosophy and sociology, is vital to such an understanding. In fact, it is ironic that philosophy is singled out in this respect, as philosophers in Brazil were among the pioneers of paraconsistent logic, a research program that has had impact in such diverse areas as robotics and expert systems for medical diagnosis. The contribution of academics to public debates is also of crucial importance to a well-functioning democracy. Thus, an attack on philosophy and sociology, as well as the humanities and social sciences more generally, is an attack on the very fabric of a democratic society. End quote. And what they said about philosophy is is such a great example, David, of what I meant earlier when I said that universities or just the ability for people to think freely and explore problems without having to worry about you know immediate practical application is where we derive many benefits in society. And philosophy here is a great example where they're saying, you know, people in the philosophy department in Brazil were able to develop this new way of thinking, this new logic system that then other people in different disciplines of robotics and medical diagnosis were able to apply to an immediate applicable pursuit, right? Yeah, I mean, that's the beauty of education for education's purpose for the discovery of new types of knowledge. Uh, A philosophical approach to thinking by itself is not going to have any sort of economic value. We can't quantify that and say it's going to be, you know, according to our books, generate the university this much money. 
But that's the difficulty of trying to estimate the effects of, of these discoveries or new ways of doing things um, on the creator economy, on each of us uh, as a whole. Because a new way of thinking by itself, like, okay, yeah, whatever, how can I profit off of that, as some bean counter might say. But if it cross-pollinates into all these other parts of our, our society, it might be the little bit of a catalyst that somebody needs to make some major breakthrough that maybe not even necessarily generates a lot of money, but makes our world a much better place. And so the threat of losing that kind of development is something that we should all be concerned about, not just the people in Brazil. Uh, because, you know, knowledge now, we live in this great time when knowledge can cross these borders that we've decided to build around the world, where it can jump, start anywhere, kick off new types of discoveries, new industries, uh, new eras in, in human thought and relationships with each other. And any sort of threat to that in any place on Earth regardless of whether it's your home or it's somewhere else, is, is a attack on each and every one of us because it's making the world materially worse. And that's what this is. The, the conversion of academic institutions from public goods designed to serve the long-term future of humanity into places that are designed to be self-sufficient, to run on market-based ideas, uh, to generate a profit instead of being supported by all of us, uh, has really sort of Rob this from us. It's another short-sighted sacrifice we're making to preserve the now and make the immediate future better in a sacrifice to our long-term future for our children, our grandchildren, in the same way that we've decided to destroy the world to profit at this moment um, and, and, and doom us, you know, just a few decades down the line. We're doing the absolute exact thing except in terms of how we interact with the world, the, the gross knowledge that all of humanity accumulates. Um, and and that's, that's what gets me so fired up about this episode, Daniel. I mean, we can break all this stuff down to numbers and stuff, and we, we will and we do. Uh, but, but really, this is an attack on all of us. Every university that decides to sacrifice something in order to, you know, push another business graduate out or, or to push us down this professionalized pathway or, or to generate another alumni who's going to make a lot more money for the university rather than somebody that is pursuing something that they love passionately uh, it, it is a robbery from from you and from me and from all of humanity. And that's a crime. Yeah. And, and I don't want to I don't want to sound like, you know, we're saying universities are that are this great opportunity to be this you know bastion of democracy for all of us. No, of course not. And there's a lot of criticism against the universities and higher education in general as ways of uh, reinforcing you know, elitism in our societies. And this is something maybe we can speak to, and that's absolutely true. But I would argue, David, that a lot of these negative trends we're seeing is precisely because of this market logic and competition that creates the need for universities to sell a product because they have to compete, right? And then by selling a product, they're, they're trying to offer something exclusive that opens the door for more class privilege to set in. And of course, we have you know, universities themselves kind of being layered along this class uh, stratification where the for-profit predatory colleges are preying on the economic vulnerable racial minorities, um, basically giving them this false hope of social mobility and being able to participate in the economy. Meanwhile, those more privileged people are going to these more expensive and exclusive universities where they get to have this you know, this box ticked on their resume that can separate them from other people or, or gives them access to new networks. In fact, uh, so one of the things he says in this dystopian imagining of future universities is their increasing reliance on high overseas student fees. And this is something we've talked about, David, that you kind of have uh, some thoughts on, right, in terms of the universities in your own backyard. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, like I mentioned earlier in this episode, I have a lot of friends who are in grad school. I have a lot of friends who are very much in debt to grad school. I have one friend uh, in particular. I, I don't know if he listens. If he does, hey, man, I'm so sorry. Um, he went to a, a great uh, undergrad school. He went to a great graduate school. Um, he's, he's finishing up his degree in, in his grad program right now. But between these two schools, uh, he's taking on, what is it, $350,000 in debt. And uh, he's just accepted at this point that he will never, ever pay any of that off. And I mean, that's a very extreme case, but there are lots of stories I hear like this. So I, I occasionally will do guest lectures um, at, at universities uh, here in New York for uh, film study stuff. We have a lot of great film schools here. Um, and I'll lecture the, the grad students on color correction, uh, which is my professional day job when I'm not I'm making this show, which seems to take up more and more of my time all the time. Um, 
So I'll go in, I'll teach them color correction. I'm looking actually to get into uh, an adjunct uh, position at one of these universities, partially for healthcare reasons. That would be nice. David, I've told you multiple times, I'm not going to start calling you Professor Torsivia. Well, uh, I'm going to make it stick when that happens anyway. <laughs> but so it's interesting watching these, going to these classes a lot of times though, because you know, their grad programs are small. Um, they're in the, the art side of things. So it's it's not exactly the same as, as some of these, these STEM programs or whatever. Um, but by and large, the attendees in these classes are from overseas. A huge amount of them are from overseas and a huge amount of them are from wealthy families or are willing to pay these exorbitant uh, international student fees um, in order to get access into this, you know, American film market and, and make connections and stuff there. Um, and, and routinely, you know, they're paying $70,000 a year, essentially, for this type of privilege. Uh, sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on the university. But it's a huge amount of money to be putting into these programs, um, where as a guest lecturer, I think I make like $100 for, for an entire class that I'll go do there. Um, if I was an adjunct, you know, it's just a few thousand dollars. And the question then at that point becomes like, where's this money going? If I'm in a class that has 10 people in it, you know, I'm looking at, in the university's eyes, almost a million dollars for that semester. They're taking five or six classes and the university professors are barely scraping by in many cases. So like, where's the money? Where's this all going? And, and I guess it's supporting the vast real estate networks of these universities. I guess it's building these brand new gyms. And I mean, my vision of a, a future dystopian uh, university network, Daniel, is uh, everyone is taking these online classes that have been pre-recorded, And meanwhile, the entire university is nothing but brand new gyms. And uh, everyone is just working out all the time, uh, like <laughs> on the treadmill or they're like, <laughs> like uh, uh, what's the name of that fancy uh, bike that you ride on? The one that I don't know the name of it, but. I actually worked at the gym at the University of Georgia. You know, like you walk into that facility, it is amazing. I mean, they have two different weight rooms. They have several floors. They have Olympic size pool. Everything is nice and clean. And then you notice, it, like I would walk into some of the buildings in the older, you know, science departments, you know, the chemistry building, the biology department, and it looked like the building is falling apart. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, you can very quickly see where they're putting their money. And uh, a lot of times, as it's addressed in this dystopian vision, it's it's about making your university look more competitive to serve the consumer experience, Um, in this case, the student experience. And, and when you are touring universities, they're not going to walk you into uh, some research lab or, or some like decaying uh, science lecture hall. They're going to show you, you know, here's the student center and here's our gym and here's the cafeteria and like, look at all the food you can eat. Check out our newly renovated dorms. And these things are, in their eyes, what pushes people over to coming to their university versus another one. Because at some point, you know, you're getting into more or less the same level of universities in terms of your academics. Um, you're limited to, you know, a, a, a echelon of universities based on your SAT scores or ACT, whatever your, your testing stuff is, you know, your options are whatever. And what differentiates them from each other is in the eyes of the universities and the marketing departments, these amenities. And that, that's what pushes people over the edge to come there. I don't think it's necessarily uh, true, but uh, what do I know? And I guess they wouldn't be spending all this money and all this money on the marketing and development of these centers um, unless it worked. And uh, that's partially, I guess, where some of this money is going. I think you're right about amenities being a huge part of this, but I think more generally, this idea you're talking about, about competition and having to have a product to offer that is competitive. I think this is really what it comes down to. And, and so we can look to an example and try to summarize you know, this trend. By now, most people have heard at the very least the headlines surrounding the scandal in the United States of rich people who have been paying bribes to get their children admitted into prestigious universities. Mm -hmm. uh, one man, the center of the scandal, he was paid $25 million between 2011 and 2018 by parents to do everything from inflate the test scores of their children to bribing college admission officials, right? He got children admitted that we know of from at least 750 different families. And we have to ask ourselves the question, why? Why does this happen? If the only benefit you could get from going to university was the chance to become a tenured professor, which would allow you to live out the rest of your days writing philosophical texts or teaching undergraduates the fundamentals of organic chemistry or spending your days testing the rigidity of some complex mathematical theorem, if that was the penultimate goal of higher education, second only to 
the possibility of a Nobel Prize? Would famous actresses and business people be bribing officials to get their kids in there? I don't think so. And of course, those pathways still exist, and they probably always will. But we have to admit that there are now large chunks of universities that exist, which may now be the dominant chunk of them, right? Where their purpose is to offer something that universities have never offered before, a very tangible, purchasable product. And that could come in the form of networks and connections or a direct pipeline to prestigious jobs at a consultancy firm or a district court. And since higher education is now being treated as a commodity that can and must be purchased, and since these universities have to compete for consumer money, and you know, note how our language is being reframed here, that it's not a student, it's a consumer now, or a customer, you know, these universities must therefore offer some kind of economic results. Otherwise, their revenue will dry up and they're going to die. And one of the things that comes along with competition is data and quantification. After all, how do you know if one thing is outperforming another, right? Unless you can you know, point to a line graph that shows a comparison that's based on data that, you, that is quantifying it. As Collini points out in his book, the very act of quantifying something can corrupt the initial goal. Yeah, Daniel, there's actually a little uh, phrase here called Campbell's Law that was written in 1976 that is uh, often cited in this context. And it goes something like this. The more any quantitative social indicator is used for social decision making, the more subject it will be to corruption pressures and the more apt it will be to distort and corrupt the social processes it is intended to monitor. Yeah, exactly. And that idea kind of helps explain one of these unintended consequences of quantification in public schools, even outside the university, which is in what some describe as the largest education scandal in United States history. It was discovered uh, in 2009 that I think it was 180 teachers throughout 44 schools in the Atlanta public school system. They had been falsifying student test scores. And by 2015, uh, investigations had found out that this was going on in at least 40 states around the country, including Washington, D.C., and it really kind of blew open the lid on this idea of quantifying students in this very standardized testing. It's like, is there real learning going on? Is education happening? Or are we really just looking at data that isn't actually describing what's going on in the classroom? And coming back to the university, this competition for student fees is requiring this type of quantification across the board. Because again, how do you compare one university to another unless you have some way to measure what the satisfaction that customers have on experiencing your product? But if what we expect from higher education is a society in which people are better equipped to ask deep questions, to think creatively, to explore the unknown, conduct long term, deep problem solving, initiatives, or whatever other quality we might think of, we would have to admit that these benefits are not quantifiable. They are certainly not purchasable, and therefore we won't get them through a structure in which the institutions that are supposed to cultivate them must compete against one another. But unfortunately, David, as you pointed out when you flew down to Brazil, the trend has become how can we cut public funding for universities to make them compete? And therefore, you know, the ones that can attract the most student fees will survive. But that creates an environment in which what universities can offer is turned into a commodity, whether that's prestige, class privilege, some kind of rare job or networks with certain people. And all this comes at the direct expense of long-term benefits to society. Okay, well, that's a lot of stuff, Daniel. So let me just take one moment and step back and and hone in on a couple of details here in quantification, which we all know is one of my favorite uh, things to get stuck on uh, it, throughout this show. Um, and I guess a lot of this quantification is driven by the fact that universities are struggling with funding. And there's a variety of reasons why that's the case. I mean, states, for example, just as a whole are always bankrupt, which means there's less money for public education, uh, the same at the federal level. So these universities are being supported less and less by these uh, reliable sources of funding that they can count on at all times, and therefore have to turn to alternative systems, either these patents that we've mentioned before, um, where they're actually profiting from the work done at the university itself, um, but more and more often uh, from the students who are paying to attend the universities, the customers, so to speak. And uh, if 
you are paying to attend a university, then I think that's part of the motivation we're seeing here to have to quantify what you're getting out of the university because we want to be able to see this as a good investment, especially because a lot of these people who are attending these universities are taking out large loans in order to do so. Uh, if I'm a bank, if I'm a lending organization, I'm going to want to know that I'm getting something out of my investment, basically. And and if, if the university can justify the fact that, you know, look at these numbers, then we might be stepping in, in that right direction. We can justify these large loans that we're making. So um, all that aside, let, let's, let's take a look at some of this. Um, you know, we've talked about busy work a lot on the show especially in that bullshit jobs episode that we did, but also throughout this, uh, this larger theme of like, what are we doing with our lives uh, with all this busy work right now while we're in the middle of this mass extinction around us, uh, which is such a surreal thing that I, I, I get stuck on a lot. But I mean, professors themselves, who are these people who are supposed to be our most educated and specialized people on earth, um, who are really digging down into these very specific topics uh, on the very forefronts of the generation of new knowledge, they are increasingly seen uh, as administrators, uh, people who are doing uh, bureaucratic busy work, uh, both because universities require more busy work in the first place, filling out new paperwork, uh, making sure they can justify all this stuff. Hang on, there's an ice cream truck driving by. That's summertime, baby. I mean, they're filling out paperwork. They're doing all these, this, this data that we would normally say should be done as administrative tasks, if it should be done at all which in many cases it shouldn't, but only now have to be done and filed and, and calculated and quantified so somebody can justify the investment on the balance sheet at the end of the day when you're sending out to investors in the university and blah, 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 blah. Instead of their actual purpose, which is to research things, to push knowledge forward, and then impart that knowledge on students. And so we're wasting the time of these people who should be you know, the most important people in terms of knowledge in all of humanity. Uh, instead, we're taking them and uh, making them into managers and taking their time and saying this is more important for you to do because we have to quantify everything. I want to pull one more quote from uh, Kalini's book, and I, I promise this is the last excerpt, but he speaks about the rise of managerialism in this quantification. And it's a really important point. Quote, managerialism operates through various mechanisms, not just by means of direct command. Thus, both externally and internally, a pattern of providing long-term funding in ways that are most conducive to good intellectual work has been largely replaced by a system of artificially contrived short-term competition for the necessary resources. Stable and adequate, if limited funding, is derided as extravagant feather bedding inimical to innovation. Systemic underfunding plus competition and punitive performance management is seen as lean efficiency and proper accountability. A recent report showed that academic staff in many British universities are now set annual targets for the amount of money they must bring in from external grant applications. No matter that much research, especially in the humanities, does not require lavish expenditure on equipment and postdocs. No matter that the rate of success in some grant competitions is currently running at 12%, and so the great majority of applications are wasted effort. No matter that constantly inventing and then managing large research projects may be more likely to obstruct than advance a scholar's capacity to do interesting work. Despite these and many other telling objections, the manic search for quantifiable measures of intellectual quality turns, in accordance with prevailing economistic prejudices, to money as the most reliable metric and proxy. This results in careers, and even in some cases continuing employment itself, being determined by the mechanical application of such targets. End quote. Actually, David, I have a cousin who is in a research-oriented post-grad program right now. And when he was trying to decide which school to go to, one of his considerations was the funding opportunity. And so one of the schools, which was his top choice in terms of the program, unfortunately, it was a six to seven year program, but funding was only secured by the school for the first three years. And they told him basically after year three, it's up to you to come up with your external funding. You have to go find people who will be willing to give you the grants you need to do the research you want to do. Now, luckily, he found another school that could fund him for the whole, the whole term of the program. But it just goes to show you, even from the very beginning, if he were to choose that school from day one, he's thinking, how can I do research such that I can get funding? How can I do research that's going to appeal to the type of people who can write a check? to let me stay. 
that's an incredible, I mean, you think about the way that would frame your thinking and alter the trajectory of what you want to research. It's clear that money is the number one driver, right? I mean, that's a really important consideration you have to make if you're going into one of these grad programs. And to be fair, uh, some grad programs are better than others. I have some friends and family members who are in grad programs right now uh, who are pursuing desired degrees, uh, STEM degrees, um, things in hard sciences. And oftentimes they are not only not paying for those degrees, but they are being paid to complete them because they're completing uh, research for the university, things like that. Um, so it is possible that these things exist. But if you are not in something the university sees as a money-making opportunity for them, then you're going to pay a lot for that. And then the question becomes, well, what am I getting for my money at that point? Especially when these, these graduate students, a lot of times, are doing a lot of work for the university, generating a lot of the income for the university, teaching classes for the university itself. And, and so what happens? And in extreme cases, and I have some friends who are doing this right now who are in their final years of their master's or doctoral programs, and uh, they're not taking any classes uh, they're paying, you know, seventy thousand dollars or whatever a semester for the privilege of not taking any classes and for doing research for the university that they're also paying for out of pocket or creating a thesis or whatever it is. Um, so they're paying for the privilege of going to the university, not receiving anything from the university except for maybe access to equipment and facilities, oftentimes which aren't worth anything close to the vast amount of money that they're paying for that. Uh, they could take this money and rent out an actual uh, facility or equipment for much cheaper than what they're really paying for the substandard facilities that the university is typically providing. And, and they're paying just ridiculous sums for that privilege. And, and nobody, nobody stops and looks at this and says, wait a second, this is not normal. Uh, this is just accepted that this is what you have to do if you want to play this game because universities have all the power. Uh, that degree, the connections they can give out are what matters in the end. And so you have no choice but to play along and uh, have them suck you dry in that process because there is this vast source of extremely easy to get money via the loan system, which I guess we don't really touch on too much in this episode. And we will do specifically, I think, a show just on student loans and the predatory practices of that um, as we follow up on this academic series, uh, because it really is a driver for a lot of the exploding costs that we see in the university system, uh, along with a couple other things quantification, like we mentioned, the lack of funding from federal and state sources, particularly talking about the United States in this example, of course, there are different systems around the world. Um, the UK is trying to be just as bad as we are. Um, in other places, uh, these numbers are just ludicrous, like they should be. But I mean, the question always is like, what are we getting out of this? What is the money going towards? Oftentimes, there's a, there's a question, well, you know, I'm not sure if it's actually worth it, which is why we probably see such a high burnout and dropout rate for a lot of these programs, a lot of these degrees, people never finish their masters. Um, and in many cases, you know, you, you think it's a money earning opportunity to complete your doctoral or whatever. But in many cases now, people with uh, advanced degrees earn less than people who just uh, got a bachelor's and then immediately entered the job market. So even the quantification of the degree itself oftentimes doesn't make financial sense anymore, which is just how distorted these markets have gotten. Now, I want to leave Stefan Collini's book. I skipped actually a large part of it, David, because at the end of the day, we're not here to explore, you know, what is the best environment for the scholar? You know, what conditions are, are best for quality research? I mean, those things do matter. But frankly, you know, I think there's a larger picture here. You know, we talk on this show about the systemic issues that threaten our world, the future sustainability of our world and our ability to combat those negative trends. And the fact is that life is getting more difficult for researchers for the pure scholar. But this is just a symptom that speaks to a larger destruction. And, and that is the molding of our world along ideals of market-based logic and competition. And we can learn something from the university context in that that which this logic claims to do, this market logic, the claim that it's going to improve benefits to society, it actually does the opposite. And we can point to things in our society that, that give objective evidence to that claim. Some examples might include student debt, right? In the U.S., student debt now exceeds $1.5 trillion, or about 5% of the entire U.S. economic output. That's an unfathomable amount of money. Uh, and it's not just of impacting the poor. 13% of U.S. Congress members uh, or their family have student debt, totaling about $2.5 million. But all this has also opened the door for very predatory uh, practices within higher education. You know, for-profit education, for example, has taken an interesting turn over the past couple of decades um, in response to this competition. 
and the potential to make money off the vulnerable situation many students find themselves in. And that is this this idea that we need an education to participate in the economy. And you know, before someone says, well, look at Steve Jobs, look at all these billionaires who dropped out of college. Okay, that's great maybe for a rich, privileged person who comes from a privileged family and the upper classes of our society. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of people, especially when we talk about racial minorities who are discriminated in this world, who absolutely need a college education if they want to participate in the economy that we've designed around class. And so many of these people who are economically vulnerable, they don't have a lot of choices. And so the predatory for-profit colleges have stepped in to offer them this illusion to get their money. And a 2010 investigation by the U.S. Government Accountability Office examined 15 major for-profit colleges in the U.S. and found that all of them participate in fraudulent practices. Four of those colleges outright encouraged it, but they found that admission staff frequently lied to applicants about the cost of tuition. They lied about their future career prospects. Some even encouraged applicants to lie about their own finances on their application. Some applicants were badgered by sales calls from these uh, predatory colleges. In one case, someone got 180 calls in a month some as late as you know midnight. And as the government points out in this investigation, the cost of tuition for many of these private schools is tremendously overpriced. Um, they cite an example of a massage therapy certificate that cost $14,000 from a for-profit college when a similar course from a nearby public school uh, cost only 520 right? And it's pretty well documented that these for-profit schools particularly love to target racial minorities, those who may be the first in their family to attend college and don't really have that uh, familial or cultural knowledge of how the system works. They love to target low-income segments of the population. And so Black, Latino, and other minority students now make up some 61% of all students attending for-profit schools, which is a tremendous overrepresentation relative to national demographics. I think if you look at the total nation in terms of demographics, racial minorities make up 30-something percent of students, which is you know half of how they are represented in these for-profit schools. And to make a long story short, those who attend for-profit schools on average, are charged up to 40% more for the degree than the nonprofit alternatives. And they join the ranks of alumni who are so often less prepared for participation in the labor market than if they had not gone to school at all. 20% of the alumni of Ashford University, for example, are unemployed. 75% of students who attend Arizona Summit Law School fail the bar exam. So what these schools are doing is targeting vulnerable, financially precarious, and unsuspecting people with the lure of high-paying jobs or just the ability to move up in their social and economic standing in this country. But in exchange, what they get is crippling lifelong debt and a worthless degree. And the victims are disproportionately Black, Latino, and other minorities. And unfortunately... Although the U.S. government took a modest step in the direction of restricting this behavior, the current administration is actually seeking to weaken regulation that was put in place to offer protection and recourse for students who took out loans to attend a school that ended up being shut down for fraud. (laughs) Uh, Which reminds me, there's another risk, David, of for-profit education, and it's worth pointing out. So, uh, David, let me put you back in the hot seat for just a second, okay? (laughs) Okay. What is the purpose of competition? Uh, what what type of competition? I think you gotta you gotta narrow that down a little bit. Well, I mean, what other kind? What kinds of competition are there? I mean, so like, are you talking friendly competition or like economic competition? Because I have different answers. So economically, let's we're we're talking about the free market here. Okay, my my free market one hundred and one. The competition. The point of it is to ultimately make sure that all capital and resources are. Uh, collected in a single individual and the rest of us battle for them in a Thunderdome like uh, scenario so that we can have enough food and water uh, to survive one more day in the hellscape that we've created. Oh, wait, um, wait, I'm not supposed to say that part. What I meant to say was that uh, competition is to foster uh, innovation and uh, make sure the market operates as efficiently as possible. I'm going to go a little bit in the middle of those two extremes, David. (laughs) And say that for the most part, competition 
the purpose of it is to allow the winners to win and the losers to lose. Okay. Okay. I think that's what I said the first time. More or less. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. You get A plus. Daniel's for profit, A plus university. Well, when education, right, is applied to this logic, uh, we have examples like Education Corporation of America, which apparently was one of those losers because in December 2018, it shut down pretty much all of its schools and that left 20,000 students who had paid for courses or taken on debt empty handed. And ironically, their schools were vocational focused, which, you know, designed to prepare students for immediate employment. But this is a part of an overall trend. Over the past five years, 450,000 students have experienced their campuses close mid enrollment. One student, uh, her name is Lisa Lamore. She was three weeks away from graduating from the Art Institute of California after she spent six years working towards her degree. Well, the campus closed in March of 2019, and that meant that she ended up with nothing after all that time. And again, between 60 and 70 percent of the students who are displaced by these closures, those are racial minorities. And of course, the same thing is happening in charter schools, right? Primary schools. Right now in Washington, D.C., the D.C. Charter School Board has closed a handful of schools over the past year, and it's impacting thousands of children, right, who are left all of a sudden without immediate access to education, or maybe their parents now have to move and take them to a new school district. But this is one of the fallouts of rearranging our education system around competition. Not only are poor people preyed on, not only are we shackling people with debt, but we also socialize the risk that when an institution fails because it couldn't live up to its investor expectations, then all those students who took a chance on this institution, they're left with nothing. Well, left with nothing, Daniel, isn't so bad as everyone left with negative nothing with their student debt. But I suppose, David, that brings us to the question we always ask, which is, what can we do? We can become a world of autodidacts, Daniel, with all the free time that we have because we are producing less uh, consumeristic bullshit and uh, we have to spend less of our life working in order to produce that and, uh, and afford it. We have all of our, our needs met because we're living so sustainably. It enables us to live uh, a life where we can pursue the academic passions that we all want to uh, on our own time without the pressures of the university or the crushing uh, debt that is associated with it. And uh, all knowledge will advance uh, wonderfully and uh, increasingly at a, at a rapid and worldwide pace. And uh, our poetry will beat even that of AI and uh, things will be groovy. I, I actually don't disagree with you, David. <laughs> you know, in the, in, when we had that show, uh, Busy Work, where we talked about those bullshit jobs, one of the things that we discuss in What Can We Do is universal basic access to income or some form of that. Again, it, it takes many forms and, and the, we have to be careful with that. But we absolutely have to retreat from this neoliberal conception of how free markets and, you know, competition is going to provide people the best opportunities because it's clearly been shown to be the opposite. Competition is what allows a select few people to join the ranks of elite circles in the upper echelons of our economy while everyone else suffers. And we need to reintroduce the idea of social institutions as being a public good, that there are certain things that we need access to and that we need to promote regardless of the outcome because we can't predict the outcome. You know, having a universal basic access to higher education without shackling people with debt would do a lot to end so many of the problems that we talk about here. It would end the student debt crisis. It would prevent this consolidation of universities into just engines of economic growth and jobs training. It would help break down those class barriers. Again, I mentioned earlier that universities get a lot of criticism for being elitist, and that's absolutely true. But a large part of that comes from the fact that competing for student fees means they can lock out those who otherwise can't pay for it or who otherwise don't measure up to whatever criteria they have, allowing everyone to access higher education, providing that free of charge would open the door for many people who are still stuck in economic precarity because the only options they have are these predatory for-profit colleges, which just leave them in a worse situation than they were before. And it would also improve research. Again, 
Kalini makes a very good point, which is that when researchers are forced to compete against one another for funding, it changes what they're allowed to spend their time researching. And sometimes there's a lot in the humanities that don't require a lot of money, but they do require the predictable and steady trickle of public funds that can allow them and give them the space and freedom to explore things without that pressure of having to deliver an immediate economic uh, impact. On an immediate practical level too, Daniel, I mean, there are, since we are in primary season here in the United States, a number of candidates who are discussing things like uh, universal access to university, to not have to pay for college, for college debt jubilees and forgiveness. There's various plans of, of different types. Uh, and that is a good step forward. But the problem with with just making sure that we can all pay for college doesn't fix the quantification issues that, that we see, the increasing managerial aspect of it, uh, where professors are spending most of their time filling out paperwork, things like that. Uh, so we need not only a shift in uh, the way that we pay for these things, a market around it, like you mentioned, but also just a cultural perspective of what we want our role of universities to be in our, in our world. And, and I say world really because that is the important way to look at it, because even though uh, in other parts of the world, we may have universities that are affordable for the people attending them, you know, it might only be a few hundred euros, uh, depending on where we are in Europe, if you're attending a, a university there, but still they are subject to the same limits of research uh, being forced by the university to pursue things that look uh, like they, they could be useful or profitable on the short term that can generate patents and prestige for the university. And the long-term, lifelong research projects that really push forward society so much in the past uh, are happening less and less because there's less resources available for that. And, and those are the things that they're really hard to estimate what is going to work, what's going to not work. There's a lot of failures that happen along the way. But we need to accept that failure and, and wasting of time is a huge component of academic research because there are lots of dead ends, but we won't know they're dead ends until we pursue them. And every now and then one of those dead ends is a shortcut to something that we've never imagined before. And that's going to take a large shift in the way that we see uh, our universities, how they function in this global thing. And it's going to have to be the complete elimination of quantification in that process. And that's a lot to ask for. Uh, but I think that's the the future we need to start heading towards. And, and Again, we just barely scratched the surface of a little bit in this this very introductory uh, academic show that, that really, I guess, focused primarily on this quantification aspect of our academic institutions and universities around the world. But uh, there's so much more to dig into, so much more to look at here. And uh, as we get to the end of this, you know, we, we have this phone number set up now, and I would love to hear your thoughts. I know a lot of people uh, who listen to this show are in the academic industry. Uh, they're professors, they're grad students. Uh, there are people who, who live this day in, day out. And I would love to hear from all of y'all exactly what you think needs to be done to make this, this system work, because it's not right now. And, and it, we have to do something. And uh, change begins with an idea. It's a lot to think about. As always, Daniel. But think about it. We hope you will. You can find more information about all the topics we talked about today, as well as the full transcript of this episode on our website at ashesashes.org. A lot of time and research goes into making these episodes possible, and we will never use ads to support this show. So if you like it, would like us to keep going, you, our listener, can support us by giving us a review, recommending us to a friend, visiting us at patreon.com slash ashesashescast, or you can visit our swag at ashesashes.org slash shop, where we sell stickers that are designed by listeners like you. We also have an email address. It's contact at ashesashes.org. We encourage you to send us your thoughts. We read them and we appreciate them. Or call the phone number, either way. <laughs> That's right. Give us a call on our brand new phone number, which again, the number for that is 313-99-ASHES. That's 313 313- Nine nine two seven four three seven. You can also find us on all your favorite social media networks at Ashes Ashes Cast, and come join our Discord community. We've got a lot of great people in there. We're always online. You can find a link to that on the top of our website. Click Community Discord, and we're right there. We've got another great show coming up next week, and we hope you'll tune in for that. But until then, this is Ashes Ashes. Bye. Bye bye.